All right. I'm going to go ahead and call to order the Washoe County Regional Behavioral Health Board meeting of February 14 with a roll call of the board. I am Chair Julia Ratty, uh, Assemblywoman Peters. Sir. Char Burley. Char yet. Uh, Sandy Stamates. Here. Uh, Dr. Kristen Davis Coelho. Let's see Dr. Coelho yet. Uh, Cindy Green. Here. Hey, Cindy. Uh, Dr. Tracy Biondi. Here. Dr. Biondi. Uh, Steve Schell. Here. Who's, of course, our illustrious vice chair. Uh, Wade Clark. Present. Hi, Lieutenant. How are you? Well, thank uh, you. Great. Frankie Lemus, I believe Frankie let us know that he would not be able to attend today. Uh, Henry Soto. Don't see Henry yet, but I believe, yep, we have uh, the six that we need to have a quorum. And so we are good. Moving on to agenda item number two, which is public comment. Uh, this is an agenda item that is open to comment on any item that is not on the agenda. If you are out there in the public and you would like to make a comment, you'll have two minutes. Is there anybody who would like to make public comment? And if so, you can use the tool to raise your hand or just turn on your camera and wave at me. And if that's not working, just unmute your mic. Going once for public comment, going twice. All right, doesn't look like we have public comment. I did see that uh, Henry Sotelo has joined the meeting. So we'll go ahead for the record and mark him as present as well. Dorothy, if you see any additional board members jump on that we need to note for the record, please let me know. Okay. All right, moving on to agenda item number three, which is approval for, of the minutes for January of 2022. The board should have received those minutes in advance. Does anybody have any questions or changes for the minutes? Seeing none, I'd look for a motion to approve the minutes. Sandy Staymates makes a motion to approve the minutes. Okay, I've got a motion from Sandy Staymates. Can I get a second? Cindy Green, I second. All right, motion from Sandy, second from Cindy Green. All those in favor on the board, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Oh, thanks, Henry. Any opposed? <laughs> Seeing none, motion passes unanimously. Chair Reddy, Char Burley has joined us for the record. Fantastic. Welcome, Char. Thank you. All right. Well, that was an efficient agenda items one, two, and three, if I do say so myself. I'm sharing. Very <laughs> complimentary to myself. Sorry. Um, so we are going to move on to agenda item number four, which uh, many of us have been looking forward to uh, at our last behavioral health board meeting perhaps the one before uh, what the board had an interest in getting an update on all of the good work that is being done in our community around homeless efforts. And there has been a significant amount of change um, in the recent past. And so I'm very excited that Katrina Peters, who I know to be a very busy woman, was able to make some time to join us today to give us an update. And so Katrina, uh, I'm going to make you would you like to share your own slides or would you like us to do that for you? Either is fine. Okay, I will go ahead and make you a co-host so you okay. can share yourself. That way you can drive your slides at the pace that you'd like. Okay. I'm gonna do a screen share. Is everyone able to see it in presentation mode? Okay, I'm getting a thumbs up from Dorothy, great. Well, I'm Katrina Peters, data and policy specialist with the Washoe County Office of the County Manager, um, Housing and Homeless Services Group. 
I appreciate um, being invited to join you today to provide an update. There have been a lot of changes recently in our region, and I understand we've got about 10, 15 minutes this afternoon together. Is that about right? I'm seeing some head about, nods. All right. <laughs> that's about right. If there's good questions, we'll, we'll, we can let it go a little longer. Okay, fantastic. So first, I would just want to just start by talking about the need, and this isn't going to be a surprise to a lot of folks on the call here today, but we have tripled shelter capacity, and we're still seeing the shelter be just about full every night, especially in, during inclement weather. We get asked a lot kind of what are what is driving that. Um, of course, it's our increasing rent and housing costs. We've seen a sharp decrease in affordable housing, and I want to really call attention to that. Average rent on a one bedroom apartment right now is around $1,400, um, which is really out of reach for folks um, working in the service industry. Basically anyone making less than $22 an hour is gonna have a really challenging time meeting that average rent. We've also seen wages be stagnant, COVID job losses and Reno growth have a significant impact. So I just cannot underscore enough the need for more affordable housing in our region. You'll see here um, on this chart, our green line is the number of unsheltered people from our point in time count. And you'll see that really sharp increase over the last three years. That orange line is the number of affordable housing units in our region. Um, the enterprise plan forecasted in 2019 that we were about 25,000 units short. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in the end, but we have not made progress on that really astonishing shortage. You'll also see in our blue line, um, average rent for just a one bedroom apartment, which is now a little over $1,400. Um, and Katrina, can we just clarify uh, for the conversation and the record that when you're, when you're talking about affordable housing there, you are talking specifically about subsidized units where there is a program to keep those rents down. Correct. As opposed to what may or may not naturally be available in the market. Absolutely, thank you. Great. Thank you. All right, so I wanted again, just I know a lot of you already know these facts and figures, but wanted to just underscore the, the tremendous amount of need and how that's really impacting the number of people experiencing homelessness. Uh, next, I wanted to just kind of highlight some of our big steps um, in this tremendous transition we've seen here in our region. So in January of 2021, the Washoe County Board of County Commissioners, through their strategic plan workshop, provided direction that they would like the county to take a larger role in homeless services. Uh, what that translated to was in May, um, the CARES campus opened, City of Reno um, oversaw the construction of that facility. In that same month, um, we brought on staff. We also opened the Washoe County Safe Camp in June of 2017. I'm going to talk about that project in a little more detail. Um, throughout the summer, there were continued negotiations. Um, an interlocal agreement between the jurisdictions was signed in, on August 30th. And then on September 1st, they handed us the keys to the CARES campus. So it was a, an expedited transition <laughs> and made for some really exciting times. Um, but those are kind of the official dates. And, and I like to show this on a timeline just because I think it highlights how quickly things um, were, were put into motion over the summer. Um, into the fall, then that was kind of continued transfer of contracts. Um, we sort of inherited the contract with the contracted operator at VOA at the CARES campus, and we've been continuing to take on um, various contracts of vendors um, as time has gone on. Lots of folks have kind of asked, like, you know, what, what, what work is this new group doing? We've hired on a lot of new staff for this housing and homeless services group. And I kind of have been describing it in three basic buckets. The first is the continuum of care that we've also aligned with that built for zero work. So that's transitioning the HUD continuum of care. Um, City of Reno was the lead entity that's transitioning over to Washoe County. We received direction from HUD that we should wait until funding awards are made from the most recent competition. And we're expecting that to happen probably this month or next. Their guidance was like, get those funding awards out and then finalize that transition. So while moving the COC over was approved through that inner local, it's just taken a while um, through these kind of HUD requirements and a funding cycle to get that completed. And Katrina, I'm not sure that everybody on this call will know what a continuum of care specifically is. So would you just take a minute? Sure. Uh, a continuum of care is a program um, as defined by HUD to kind of give it some common language, it's really HUD's way of saying, we're gonna give you some federal funding. You need to come together as a community and make some decisions together 
on what your funding priorities are and what your policies are going to be. Um, and so as a community, you identify a lead entity um, that was City of Reno historically um, and SCI, I see Kelly's on the call. They staffed that role for about 20 years. It transitioned to City of Reno and then it's come over now to the county. So really, um, you know, HUD loves their very verbose descriptions of things and, and the continuum of care is not immune from that. But it's really HUD's way of saying, come together as a community, work together, make decisions together, we'll provide you some funding. Um, so we've also um, continued to move forward with our Built for Zero work. And that's um, kind of divided up into three main areas. The first is around data. And I'm gonna show some examples of data we've been sharing. They ask you to monthly report out number of people experiencing homelessness. We also give some details on inflow and outflow. We've been tasked through Built for Zero with coordinating outreach efforts. Historically, we've had a lot of kind of siloed outreach efforts. They task you with bringing that together. We've recently um, approved an outreach policy through that continuum of care. And again, just getting, getting our community to agree on how we're gonna go about some of that business. We've also done a lot of work to get case conferencing meetings up and going. We have four case conferencing meetings that meet every other week looking at a list of a specific population of people experiencing homelessness, getting providers around the table and trying to match up the two. We've got a veterans group that looks specifically at veterans that are homeless. We've got a transition age youth group for that 18 to 24 age group. We've got unsheltered that focuses just on, on folks that those outreach, uh, people doing outreach work have identified as being unsheltered. And then we've got a fourth group that's focused really on people who are participating in a coordinated entry system and have an active referral. And the idea there is people who have an active housing referral, who knows where this person is, how can we find them and work them through the process. We've had a lot of success with that. Um, and so we're continuing that work forward. Our next kind of bucket of work is really around the programs that we're overseeing. And most of these um, our county overseeing a program, contracted operator, kind of the boots on the ground. So the first is our safe camp. Um, we've got 45 tents and we popped that up this summer. Um, people who are living unsheltered, we've got a full-time case manager. We provide basic services. We've seen a lot of success with that program and I'll show you some of our data um, on our exits in a minute here. Of course, the CARES Campus Emergency Shelter is kind of the largest and the one that folks are most familiar with. And then we also recently opened a cold weather overflow. We've got 52 beds to try to meet that extra need during our cold weather months. And then our third bucket is the housing work. Um, we were able to bring on JD Klippenstein to help us with some housing policy work. We've also received some federal funds, um, ERA2 and, and a, a little bit of ERA1 work as well. We've also brought on two housing navigators to try to build out some landlord relationships um, and see if we can do a little bit of work there. So those are kind of our three main buckets. To get into a little bit of detail, as I mentioned through the Built for Zero work, they really put a strong focus on the data. And we have uh, each month reported quite a bit of data. Um, and here's kind of a visual of what that data looks like. It's the number of people experiencing homelessness and it's divvied up by some specific subpopulations. This is on our website. So folks are welcome to kind of check it out in more detail. I did wanna highlight that this information comes out of the Homeless Management Information System or HMIS as it's kind of commonly referred to. And I highlight that because programs that are not participating in HMIS, their data is not included in these numbers. Um, and folks who aren't receiving services or interacting with any agency, they are not included in our count as well. Um, I've got the link here so folks can kind of check that out in closer detail, but if folks need kind of some basic data, number of people experiencing homelessness, this is a great resource. We've also recently um, started up a shelter census dashboard. This has gotten a lot of traffic and um, I've provided the URL so folks can take a closer look. This shows in quite a bit of detail the number of beds are, that are available. We publish this uh, at 9 a.m. each morning. So it's kind of an accounting of what's available in the morning. Beds do change without, throughout the day. So it's not a, a real-time moment by moment update. If you click on these tabs here on the top, you can also see the historical data. So if folks are curious about bed utilization um, at these four facilities, this is a great, great place to get those details. 
Um, moving on to CARES Campus, um, we've kind of had a couple recent updates. One is that we have identified a women-specific dorm. Um, the CARES Campus was not initially intended to serve women um, based on expanding the number of women beds at our place. The idea is that the idea initially was that that would meet the need. It turns out we did not project the need um, and there's quite a few women who are housed at the CARES campus. So we've, we've set out a women only area to be able to better, better monitor that. We are bringing on Mod Pods and I'll show you a picture of what a Mod Pod looks like, but basically they're individual shelters. We'll be putting those up at the safe camp. Um, we open overflow, that's 52 beds again to kind of meet that cold weather need. We've um, been pretty lucky through COVID-19 um, and being able to kind of mitigate those risks. Um, and thankfully we've not had a substantial outbreak at the CARES campus. We're also preparing for construction. So the sprung structure is a 46,000 square foot structure. There were no bathrooms inside the facility. So we're gonna be engaging on a construction project to get adequate bathrooms and permanent showers and a cafeteria space on site. Um, we're also working through a lot of partnership development. I see some folks on the call that I've worked on MOUs with. We were really trying to get partners to the campus to facilitate some service referrals. There's also been a lot of work to recruit staff. We experience a lot of staffing shortages um, and we're really trying to work hard to engage folks um, to come and, come and provide some help with that. So here are four priorities, staffing and training. And again, this has been a huge challenge. Safety and security, also a really large challenge with a large sprawling campus. Capacity management and making sure we're having enough beds to fill the need and our partnership development efforts as well. So for Safe Cam, and we've gotten quite a bit of media attention, um, but we initially utilized camping tents because that allowed us to get that program just up and off the ground immediately. Um, that was about June 17th. We went forward and purchased Mod Pods that are an eight by eight individual shelter. They have heating and cooling. The idea there is to get folks out of the elements. Um, we put that purchase order in. We were promised that certain delivery timelines would be met. Um, unfortunately, we were not immune to the supply chain logistics and COVID challenges that the whole country is experiencing. So we, um, on a Monday, decided we were going to need to move folks into the bays. Um, this was a Reno Housing Authority property, but this was our opportunity to get folks in um, a space out of the elements and heated. So we moved all of our safe camp participants and did the construction to sort of frame out the entryway in a day. <laughs> it was really exciting. Um, we had a lot of great partnership. Our contracted operator, Karma Box, has been amazingly helpful, um, but it was, it was quite the effort. Um, just a few more pictures here. You can kind of see initially what we were working with with tents and, and how that just wasn't going to get us through the winter. Um, in the bays, um, we're able to maintain about 65 degrees, so it's not warm and balmy, but definitely much better than being outside in a tent. Um, folks still have some personal space and they were able to just move their tent right over. We do put a little bit of a limit on personal possessions to what folks can fit inside their tent. Um, and there's a lot of challenges around possessions, but a great opportunity to kind of shape some new behaviors. We have received Mod Pods and are currently um, in the construction process to get those up kind of where the tents formerly were. You can see a picture here. Um, it's an eight by eight unit. Um, it has heating, cooling, and the opportunity to plug in and charge things like phones, laptops, et cetera. We've got a bike rack on the outside. Um, there's a bunk bed, and we're also providing a mattress and a pillow. So, you know, not, not super glamorous, um, but really an opportunity to keep folks safe, give them some security. There's a locking key code to each unit. So um, really in an effort to uh, get folks stable, cut down on the theft um, while we're working with folks on their housing plan. Um, the criteria to be at the safe camp, we really just have two main eligibility criteria. The first is, are you willing to end your homelessness as soon as you're able to? And the second is, can you take care of your activities of daily living? We wanna make sure folks are safe to be there. Um, and really the housing goal, we've had everything from, I wanna to move to Cabo to I wanna to move to Hawaii to I just want an apartment by myself. Um, we'll take any goal, but we do look for folks to be able to articulate some sort of a housing goal so we have something to work off of. As I mentioned, we've seen a lot of success with this safe camp model. 
um, of our exits, 58% uh, of those have been successful exits to permanent housing. And we're looking to the HUD definition for permanent housing there to try to standardize that. Um, so you can kind of see that data here. We also have, have shared this quite a bit through CHAB and other venues, but I think the safe camp model really speaks to the possibility for success with an appropriate uh, staffing ratio and keeping sm programs smaller. Um, it's a place where folks wanna be and what we're seeing with a, the CARES campus is just the sheer volume and number of people is really intimidating. To speak to that sheer volume, um, here's a little bit of data on the number of clients served. Um, over here on the left, this is the number of unduplicated or unique clients served each month. Over on the right hand side, you see the number of bed nights. So this is the number of you know, heads on beds for lack of a better way of describing it. For December, you'll see we had just under 18,000 bed night stays. So it really speaks to the volume that we're seeing at the shelter um, and the tremendous amount of need. We've got a little bit of demographic information. So you can kind of see here, it's, it's largely single men, but we have some couples and women as well. And then here is our exit data from the CARES campus. And this was also shared at CHAB. So apologies if this is a bit of a repeat, but we see a much smaller number of exits to permanent housing. Um, just under 6% of total exits are to that kind of HUD definition of permanent housing. And I think the folks at VOA, you know, have done a tremendous job with the just incredible challenge of the CARES campus. Um, but we do kind of see a need to bring on some additional resources, bring on additional case management staff to try to increase this number and get folks housed out of the CARES campus. This next slide, I think, also really highlights the challenges we're seeing with staffing. So here you can see in kind of this um, teal color, we've got 74 staff filled, 40 empty spots to get us up to just the minimum amount we need to meet those basic ratios. So just a huge need for staffing um, to be able to get that CARES campus up to a appropriate staffing level. At Safe Camp, we're fully staffed. Um, Allied is our on-site security uh, provider, they have some staffing challenges as well. And then here on this Washoe County bar, this, this number 29, this is the case management and mental health counselor staff that we'll be bringing on um, to provide those services to the campus. So we're in the hiring process right now. Um, the case manager and case manager supervisor roles are posted on the Washoe County website. So if you know anyone who's interested, uh, check that out. This is just a quick picture of our cold weather overflow. So we're utilizing four of these garage bays. You can see we did a little bit of construction to make kind of the front entrance um, just kind of workable uh, and a window for safety. It is cots. So we provide a, a blanket to keep folks warm, um, but it's, it's really basic. These, these units are heated as well. Um, so not super balmy, but just providing the basics so folks can get some sleep at night. Switching gears a little bit and talking about housing, and I know I kind of started with that, but wanted to bring it back around um, to show just the tremendous amount of need of affordable housing in our region. So these are visuals from the enterprise plan. Um, so this is not new information, but in asking uh, JD, our housing policy expert, you know, all right, this is from uh, 2019. So have we have we made some progress? Do you have some good news? And he's like, no, <laughs> we need just just as much, if not more. Um, so just a huge, huge amount. There's kind of that 26,000 number in the Truckee Meadows of affordable units needed just for renters. So really just a, an incredible amount of need there. As you are a policy board, I wanted to end with just a few policy remarks and a couple areas where we're really seeing some significant gaps and challenges that I think need to be addressed on a policy level. Um, the first is reimbursement rates for group homes and other supportive living environments. Um, what we've seen is that group homes that have existed historically in our community due to the high cost of rent and the low Medicaid reimbursement rate, those options have really dried up. Um, and that um, is not always the most attractive choice for folks, but is often kind of the most cost effective for folks who need to be in a little more supportive environment. We also have a huge lack of permanent supportive housing. Um, and this is kind of looking at that HUD definition of supportive housing not only providing, um, paying for, for rental costs, but also matching that with some case management um, to make sure folks are stable in that housing and wrapping around services. 
We also, and, and I'm sure this is no surprise to this group, see a huge lack of mental health and substance use treatment options. I um, mean, those, th there's also a significant amount of limitations related to payer source. Um, and again, I'm sure that's no surprise, but just having those limited options for folks that need that treatment um, folks are, are just ending up at the CARES campus with not a lot of options, which is not, not a great spot for someone experiencing substance use disorder or mental illness. Um, again, lack of affordable housing, also lack of renter protections, and a landlord unwillingness to accept housing vouchers. So even for our programs where we have vouchers issued, and we've made some good progress here due to some additional vouchers that HUD made available to our community, we're still, it's not uh, it's, it has to be in line with fair market rent and with the, you know, open market being so high for rent, we see landlords being really unwilling to work with us when we're trying to house a client with a voucher. Um, so those are kind of my four, four policy items that I would love to see an impact on um, and we'll be happy to, to take questions or hear any comments from the group. Nice job, Katrina. Thank you so much. That was a great overview. So we will open it up to the board first. Um, I did want to note for the record that Dr. Davis Quello joined at 3.08 um, for the minutes. And then did any other board members join that I might have missed? All right, seeing none, uh, I'll turn it over to the board for questions. Those questions. Or was it so comprehensive, Lieutenant Clark? <laughs> just uh, out of curiosity, the ones that don't get successfully housed, are they just going back out into the community or are they still staying at the shelter? Yeah, so for this exit data, you'll see just, just looking at December data, we have a large number of people who exited. We don't have, we don't have data on where they went. Might be that they self-resolve, looking at it from an optimistic standpoint. Might be that they got a, a motel for a night or two and ended up coming right back. Um, we'll be looking at long-term recidivism rates, you know, as we're open for longer periods of time. But really, um, what we want to try to focus on is increasing that successful exit, so folks don't don't need to access CARES Campus again. Great question, Lieutenant. Do you have a follow-up? Nope, oh, thank you. That's what I needed to hear. I have a quick question on the, um, you mentioned the motivation for housing, um, that they, they had to sort of demonstrate some motivation. Um, I'm curious about um, how many people sort of just tell you that they, they are not interested and they would prefer to be homeless, perhaps except for during the winter. Or I, that's what I'm assuming. Maybe that's not even true. So, so for... Katrina, before you answer, that was uh, just for the record, that was Dr. Biondi. Go ahead. So uh, that statement applies specifically to safe camp. That's part of our, you know, we have two eligibility criteria. One is, are you willing to solve your homelessness as soon as you're able to? And then that activity is a daily living piece. And so we're really leading with that expectation that this is not a permanent, safe camp is not a permanent destination. Um, and that agreeing to come into the safe camp is agreeing to work on your housing plan. Um, that, that is a condition of being able to stay in safe camp is that you have to continue to make progress towards that housing goal. And that can look really different for a lot of folks, right? Some folks that might be, you know, job applications and apartment applications. For some folks, it might be, hey, did you take a shower today? We're really meeting people where they're at, but we're not leaving them there. And Katrina, just to, just to build on that for folks who might be newer to this topic. So the CARES campus main facility is a no barrier shelter. So, so therefore folks can come and they can come whether they have that commitment or not. Whereas the safe camp as a se separate program can have more stringent rules or guidelines for folks who can participate. Is that, is that accurate way to describe it? Sure. Um, CARES Campus is a low barrier shelter um, and we want to be able to serve people seeking emergency shelter. Safe camp is, is also relatively low barrier. Um, there's no drugs or alcohol allowed on either campus, but we know that we're going to be serving folks who are actively using. Pets are also allowed at safe camp, um, and we're serving couples as well to try to, to bring those barriers down. Yeah, okay. great. Thank you so much. No, I was not aware that there was a difference, uh, but now I understand. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Biondi. Other questions from the board? Assemblywoman. 
Thank you. I, um, I have a couple of questions. My first is, can you give us a status update on those mod pods? You said you have received a few, but um, what does it look like for the, the remainders that you haven't received yet? So I believe we'd actually, we've received all the units. We're in the process of construction. Um, and we've we've had some challenges due to COVID. So we, we would have hoped that they were already up, um, but we do have a construction company putting those together and there is a, a strong sense of urgency to get those up. Okay. Are they high, hardwired into utilities also? I'm gonna get really over my skis quickly because I don't know a lot about utilities, okay. but <laughs> they are um, a plug-in. Um, so we wired it so that they could be plugged in in the current temporary location. When construction's done in the lower bowl, we'll be moving the units down there. Okay. Um, if I may, Chair, I've got a couple of question, uh, of other questions related to parts of the presentation. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, can we talk a little bit about some of the exit support efforts that you guys provide? Um, beyond what you were describing earlier when Lieutenant um, Clark asked his question, um, I'm thinking things like ensuring folks are getting identification in line so that they can apply for um, for services and other things that you need, just a basic birth certificate or state ID for um, and the likes of that. Yeah, so at Safe Camp, we have a full-time case manager and often that identif identification piece is kind of the first step towards that housing goal. You know, if you don't have an ID or a birth certificate, that can really hinder your housing options. She's working with them on a variety of, you know, signing up for benefits, pursuing things that they're eligible for. We've had some folks that came to safe camp who previously had a survivor benefit or retirement benefit, got disconnected from that. We're getting them uh, reinstated with those benefits so they have that income to support that housing. So it, it really is, is bundled together. Are you doing any of that work at the CARES campus? Right now, VOA has uh, four case managers. Uh, I'm sorry, they have nine case managers and a case manager supervisor. There's 604 people at the campus. So we're still not at an appropriate staffing ratio. And that's why we're moving forward with bringing on those 29 county staff to be able to get those case management ratios to where we need it to be. That 29 staff also includes some mental health counselors because we see a tremendous need for kind of stabilization and de-escalation. Um, our place has um, some mental health staff on site and have seen tremendous benefit of that. So we're looking to try to replicate those uh, benefits. I guess um, uh, just a future question I would have is for the CARES campus, is there any opportunity to take that campus and like kind of break it up into smaller pods so that it's easier to handle that, that um, overwhelming population? And then my last question is related to the data you provided on the number of people experiencing homelessness. And it looks like your non-veteran, non-chronic adults without children has just seen some enormous growth this year, um, particularly though in January. And I'm wondering, thinking about how cold it has been in January, do you think that that's a seasonal increase or do you think that that's like tied more closely to the rental market? So to address your first question, um, segmenting out that giant building is part of the construction plan. Um, so we're, we're tracking on that, kind of separating out that women's dorm was the first opportunity. It's really limited based on staffing. So we need to have enough staff to kind of segment those areas and have staff checking people in and out. We've been really limited. Um, but we're going to work on some through that construction plan, um, building some, some boundaries within the facility, there will also be some areas that are kind of more of a cubicle style. We're calling them cubbies to provide folks with a little bit more privacy um, in addition to having some kind of bunk bed, lower barrier areas. Um, so I definitely appreciate that comment and I think a great strategy. And then your second comment was on our non-veteran, non-chronic. So basically this is single adults, is that blue bar? <clears throat> and we have seen um, a bit of an increase. There could be a couple things going on here. We do see more folks accessing shelter in the colder months. Um, CARES Campus participates in, in HMIS, and so that could be part of um, where we see that increase. We've also done a lot of work to try to get more people utilizing HMIS, um, so that could be a contributing factor. But typically, we do see an increase in number of people seeking shelter in the winter months, so that would kind of be my top guess. And then, Katrina, I want to highlight this and verify 
my, to make sure that I'm understanding. So Assemblywoman, just remembering that for the shelters, it's a subcontract to a nonprofit that manages the shelter. So VOA at the CARES campus and RISE at the Our Place. And what's unique and different that is happening, and I, I only highlight this because it was also an initiative in the Community Health Improvement Plan, is that the county is taking on a case management role so that regardless of who the provider is that's running the shelter, there will be ongoing and consistent case management. And that was all those new hires that was on the one, one slide was case managers and mental health. And that's really the path to get to a group of people who are there to work with folks to take whatever that person's next step is. And this is a shifting in the model of how we've done this in the past where rather than having the contractor totally responsible for all the services, the county is keeping a chunk of services that we need to consistently have regardless of who's operating the shelter. Katrina, is that an accurate description? That was perfect, thank you. <laughs> okay. Because I think it's a huge step forward and just trying to connect some dots of then we will have paid professional, they're paid obviously, but we'll have professional case management management that stays consistent sort of regardless of count contract changes along the way. Absolutely. Um, Henry, oh, more, sorry. Sorry, just one more on the homeless management information system. Is that a, a pay for use or is that something that's provided um, at no cost for the folks who want to participate in it? So through our HUD funding, we're able to pay for a certain number of licenses throughout the community. Um, we, we have a kind of a prioritization for that. Folks who are HUD funded in those programs that are mandated to use it kind of get some of those uh, first, first pass at it. And then we've done quite a bit of outreach to try to build that out further um, and have had some success with that. But folks, um, depending on their circumstances and what kind of data they're entering would potentially have to pay for a license to use that system. Thank you, Chair, for the latitude. <laughs> You're welcome, Assemblywoman. Uh, I believe, uh, Henry Sotola, I think you were trying to get in for a question. Yes, thank you very much. Henry Sotelo for the record. Uh, I really appreciate this, uh, this information that we're gathering. This is actually more hopeful than I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> but the first question I wanna ask, and I appreciate the fact that uh, the Washoe County is picking up the case management. I think that's creates stability in providing. So along with that, I wanted to know, was, were there more plans that you may know of to provide or to have more providers there at the campus on site at different times, rather than just health care, uh, mental health professionals or case managers, do you know? Yeah, in the last, gosh, month and a half, probably we've, we've put a lot of energy towards trying to get um, just some basic agreements signed to get folks on campus. I think um, Peter yeah. Ott with Bristol Cones on, um, we were recently able to get an agreement sure. completed to bring Bristol Cone on site so that they can work through some referrals. So we've definitely um, been looking to, to not only engage some healthcare providers, some managed care organizations, but also um, a larger diversity of providers across the community. And then one more, one more question. Has there been any discussion with Reno Municipal Court to try to work with the, the community court that they hold weekly uh, every Wednesday at the uh, Washoe County Library? Has there any been any discussion to work with them to any extent? Because I could see what I've seen is a lot of the population, I'm not there every week, but a lot of the same population is flowing back and forth between CARES Campus and that court via, you know, citations or whatever, mm. or whatever they've been cited in on. And uh, I could see that as being a, a good partnership. So do you know if there's been any discussion? I could probably find out on my end if I just asked the question, but I wanted to know from you whether you heard anything. I personally have not heard anything, but we would definitely welcome it. Um, I can put my email in the chat if that's helpful. Um, Great. For us to kind of start the conversation, because I definitely think we, we share a lot of clients, I would guess. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much, Chair. All right, other questions from the board? Not seeing any hands. All right. Uh, so we will go ahead and just take 
uh, one or two questions from the audience. So is there anybody in the audience who would like to ask a question? You can just come off mute and chime in if you would like. All right. Again, the board did such a great job of asking questions. You covered it. All right, so um, I just want to express my gratitude to uh, Ms. Peters, Katrina, for coming on and sharing the information with us. I know um, from being only peripherally involved in some of these conversations that we are, are not where we want to be, but are making so many good forward steps to where we'd like to be. Um, so we're not where we were either. And I think in your presentation, that really comes through. And so we're not going to settle, but we do want to celebrate the, the wins when we can. So just congratulations to you and your team, to the team at City of Reno that also helped with the transition and did lots of good work prior to that. And to all of the community providers who are either leaning in or going to lean in um, so that we can, that we can build the system that we need. So thank you for spending the time with us. Um, super, super appreciate it. Know you're busy. Thanks and good for luck having in the hiring me. process. <laughs> thank you. Have a great day, everyone. All right, thanks. All right, so we'll go ahead and close item number four, moving on to item number five, which is a discussion and possible recommendation to Division of Public and Behavioral Health Administrator to fill the board vacancy pursuant to Nevada revised statutes. Um, this is... So our board is comprised of folks who are appointed from a number of different entities. So this position is a position that would be appointed by the administrator of the Department of uh, Health and Human Services for the state of Nevada. Uh, what we do is we send that individual recommendation of somebody we would like to have appointed. We did put out a call for applications and receive some. Um, this one is a member who represents the interests of administrators or counselors who are employed at facilities for the treatment of alcohol and other substance use disorders, remembering that behavioral health includes both mental health and substance use disorder. And so we're very excited to be able to bring forward Peter Ott with Crystal Cohen Recovery Center as the candidate that we would like to recommend to uh, Richard Whitley the administrator of Department of Health and Human Services. And so from a process standpoint, if this is successful today, it will go to him. He would still need to be able to do the appointment. And once we got that, Peter or Mr. Ott would be able to participate. So with that, uh, Peter, do you wanna just make a few comments about your interest? Yes, uh, thank you everybody. I uh, have been with Bristlecone probably six years. Uh, prior to stepping up to the um, exec vacant executive director's position, I was the administrator of our veterans program. So I've worked pretty closely with the homeless population. Uh, I really enjoyed today's presentation. I've worked with Katrina and we just entered into an MOU and the veterans that would come to us would come to us from HCHV, which is Healthcare for Homeless Vets. So I've got a lot of experience there. Um, I personally have, uh, in December, I celebrated 30 years in sobriety myself. And when the open position uh, was available here, um, I can step back a few years. Tamara Pierce, who I'm sure this board knows, um, was the executive director when I started here. And when she asked me what my five-year plan was, I said, well, to have your job and she she smiled and said well you know maybe there's a i'm thinking about retiring so it um uh, it's been a long path but i'm finally doing what i enjoy the most it's where my passion lies um i want to give back to the community that uh, has supported me so faithfully for the all these years and um i i saw that there was a couple of, I've been on a lot of these board calls and it, uh, this particular board uh, really jumped out at me as one that can make a difference. So uh, I reached out to Dorothy. Thank you, Dorothy. And it, uh, here we are. Thank you. Does, does anybody have any questions? 
either process questions or questions for Peter. All right, seeing none, I would look for a motion to recommend uh, Peter Ott, Executive Director of Bristlecone Recovery Center to the vacancy, or recommend him to DHHS to fill the vacancy. Davis. Motion to recommend. Oh. Oh, sorry, so I'm gonna go ahead and take, I'm gonna take that as a motion from Dr. Davis Polo and a second from Dr. Biondi. Good job, doctors. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, we all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. All right, so the next step is Dorothy will send that along to uh, the director and we'll hopefully get that turned around relatively quickly and get you up and running at the next meeting. Um, just a reminder, oh, dog's gonna bark. Just a reminder that um, we do have one other vacant position. It is more focused on a behavioral health provider or a mental health provider. And right now, uh, as the chair, my recommendation is just to sit on that one for a little bit. I'd like to see how the behavioral health grants process from the state moves along. And if we end up with providers in our crisis system or some of the other categories where it might make sense to have one of them participating more actively in this board. And so if uh, everybody is okay with just giving me that, that patience, we'll just sort of see who who emerges or if there's any new, new, new faces that we should be considering. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and close item number five and we will move on to item number six, which is a standing item for our board. And that is just a update on the Washoe Regional, or sorry, the Washoe C County Crisis Response System Implementation Plan. Um, and Dorothy will go ahead and make that presentation today. Thank you. And Sharati did a nice segue into this item. Um, as most of you know, the Washoe Health, uh, County Health District convened the planning project in June to support the implementation of a behavioral health crisis response system. We, and, and with my assistance as a coordinator, as part of the core team, we uh, convened and uh, the project, of course, is not going to be successful without the involvement of, of key regional stakeholders. And so we were recruiting stakeholders in six areas, a leadership council of policymakers, technical advisory committee, and then four subcommittees made of subject matter experts. Uh, SEI has done their usual fabulous job in convening those meetings. And we have tried to inspire those participants and have been quite pleased at the level of participation and discussion that we've had. Dorothy, I'm going to interrupt you. Much. I apologize. I'm just going to interrupt you for a second. I have to step away. So, Steve, the meeting is yours. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> so, there is not much update um, on the progress, other than the fact that we are having some very robust uh, discussions on each of the subcommittees, we are really waiting on the awards from the uh, NOPO from the state. We're hoping that will come out soon. And then once we see who has been awarded some of these components of the system, the crisis, and the crisis stabilization center itself, from the uh, crisis call, uh, then of course our plans will really jump into action and we'll move forward with uh, some more of the implementation plan. But um, that's just a little update and hopefully we'll have more to say next week. Um, I am going to ask um, Kelly Marshall from SEI, did I miss anything by way of an update, Kelly? I thought you did a great job, Dorothy, thank you. So thank Kelly you. Marshall for the record. Um, the only thing I'd say is that there is a lot of activity at the state level, so the state just issued their final implementation plan to the federal entity, SAMHSA, um, who has put out funding for staffing for the Crisis Support Services of Nevada Center uh, so that uh, that center can hire staff and increase their capacity to respond to the implementation of 988. 
uh, which is planned for July 16th, 2022. Um, and so as Dorothy said, you know, we are waiting for the state to make the awards. We're waiting for them to issue an RFP for the care traffic control system that will uh, be the technology hub for all of this. Um, and then hopefully those pieces come together. Uh, but it's a little bit of fits and starts, right? Um, while we're waiting to hear who the vendors uh, that have been selected for the first NOFO are. Thank, thank you, you, Dorothy. No, thank you. Uh, Chair Reddy, that closes out that item. Okay. I would just add, um, while there have been fits and starts and lots of different things, there's also been a lot of good work done. I just want to make sure that that's recognized. Six committees, lots of engagement and participation, um, good content coming out. And so that content will really come alive once we know who the who those providers are going to be. Um, but I just, it's, it's I think, challenging for all of us. We wanted to see so much more progress, um, but just want to acknowledge that there really is some good work happening in those groups and many of you are participating in them. And so just gratitude for all the time and energy people are putting into it while we wait to find out who our providers are. Um, so we'll go ahead and close item number six, moving on to item number seven. I, I will just disclose that my dog will not go out. If my husband and I are both home, my dog will not leave and he has a vet appointment. So I had to go with them to get to the car. <laughs> That's what working from home looks like. So, yay for us. Um, so moving on to item number seven, which is the uh, significant amount of work that Dorothy has put into the Washoe Regional Behavioral Health Policy Board annual re report. Um, this is an informational item today because this is the board's report. And so this gives you a chance to look at it, reflect on it for a month, and we'll approve it at the next regularly scheduled meeting. So feel free to ask questions, do whatever you need to do. This is not a final, not a final draft. Dorothy, go ahead. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? No, nope. not yet. Now? Yes, we can. Okay. So um, the good news is I'm not going to go. <laughs> read all 47 pages um, of this report. There is still some formatting. I wanna caution, this is just a draft and this, the board has received um, a preliminary copy. And as uh, Chair Raddy said, we'll have an opportunity to review it, not just for um, typos, but for format, for narrative, for content as well. But I am gonna step through the sections so that um, folks get an idea of, of what's entailed in the report. Um, I will tell you that pursuant to NRS 433, which outlines the board's responsibilities and duties, one of those responsibilities is to provide an annual report. And so the coordinators take that on. In the past each year, I have uh, developed a report. And additionally in Washoe County, um, for a couple of years, we were blessed to have an intern from UNR that assists me. And in the last couple of years, we did not have one to provide a behavioral health, um, Washoe County behavioral health profile. And what that document was, was data. Um, most of that data came from state and federal sources, CDC, um, the large portion came from the Office of Analytics uh, EPI report, significant data and a great resource. The, the challenge with that data is like many of our data sources, um, and it only comes out every two years. And so rather than not be duplicative, uh, the state has decided, and I think uh, rightly so, that they will not do an EPI report every year because the off years were somewhat duplicative. They do update some of their dashboards and I've included some of that updated data in this report. So we'll look forward next year to the, um, to the profile. But um, so section one, and again, I am just going to just kind of scroll through. So please, if you want to stop and ask questions, but this is just to give you an idea of what's in the report um, for the public. Um, this report will be available, of course, on our website, um, also on the Behavioral Health website, which I 
the note in here. And then also anyone that wants the co copy can certainly email me. So there'll be plenty of um, opportunity to get a copy of the final report. So section one is just the introduction and we have provided, I have provided some demographics. Some is based on what is available from the most current census. Um, there are still some information pending that has not been released. The estimated population of uh, Asha County in 2020 is 486,000-ish and encompassing 15.7 of Nevada's residents. So I won't elaborate beyond there, but that's the first section. The second section is an executive summary. Uh, again, what executive summaries are, just kind of a review and an overview of what you're going to see in the report to follow. Section three is the regional board policy board history. This is somewhat repetitive information that I tend to include in every report um, for the benefit of first new board members and then for the public um, that may not be familiar with our boards. And so it's important. It is updated because a fifth regional board was added in the 2018 legislative session. And again, uh, this is a draft and there's, uh, I realize I have some formatting to uh, fix, which is visible here on this next section four, duties and responsibilities. So this is for the board, particularly, I like to point out, um, pursuant to statute, you see in red, these are our action words. This is what we're responsible for. Um, I always think it's good to remind you and me of our obligations under statute for the board advise, promote, identify, coordinate, review, establish, track, and compile. And so this comes straight out of statute, but it's always a good reminder about why, why we are where we are. Section five, pretty obvious. That's just the membership for 2021. And um, please look at your names, uh, your titles, um, shoot an email if, if I need to correct those. I think there may be a couple um, we've had some resignations and um, we've had some new members come on board. I certainly wanted to recognize though those members that served so faithfully during the year before they resigned. Then just additional leadership and participants. Chair Raddy mentioned um, the different um, individuals or agencies that approve our membership. Seven of our members are board approved. And then we have one governor approval, one um, assemblyman, the speaker, uh, the majority leader, and then uh, DHHS. So it's just that. So section five, six is our meetings and presentations. In reports past, I've listed, and some of the coordinators um, have done a beautiful report and they've listed some of the details of the meetings. I chose not to in this particular report because mine is a little lengthy, but those meetings uh, can be found on the state website where all of the agendas are found. And I have that listed that one um, at the last page on our reference. So that's what that is. Section seven um, is my activities, which I felt a little um, uncomfortable putting them on. I thought, I. I don't want to sound like look at all I do. Um, but I also thought it was important for the board to see the activities and the organizations and our partners that we're touching and that there's still a lot of work to be done. So this is not all inclusive, but this gives you an idea of how far reaching our board is. It's not just our group of 12 or 13 people that meets every month. Um, there really is a wide dissemination of the information and the things that we're sharing. And I will try and bring it back to the board as well. Section eight, this is really the meat of the reports, um, our regional priorities and strategies. So um, since our first BDR, which was Assembly Bill 66 ultimately passed, our board has focused really is a main priority um, on crisis response and building on the good work that we did and it needed 
some tweaking. It, it was a, a good first salvo. Then last year or the 81st session, we passed um, Senate Bill 69. And we are continuing to build and support, and we just gave you an update on the crisis response system implementation plan. And this rises to the level of being one of our main priorities for our board in terms of support. Now, I would tell the board, um, if you um, want to add priorities, if you want to have discussion on priorities, um, then certainly, you know, contact me via email, and that can be part of our discussion. But um, right now, we have the crisis response, and I've listed the regional gap, which we all know, um, those of us that have worked on that. The strategy in progress, and I've um, taken some liberty and shared some of SEI's um, wonderful narrative, as well as some of our own, to describe what our process is, what are the components of our crisis response system, and I've listed the three legs there um, of that stool. Then some of our other um, Priorities, uh, equitable focus on substance misuse. Um, I, that was a priority that we went into last session with. We uh, know that behavior health encompasses mental health and substance misuse. And we heard because we've invited our stakeholders and our partners to bring their ideas and their thoughts to the board. And we heard a lot from some of our coalitions that there perhaps wasn't an equitable focus on substance misuse. And so we listened and actually um, many of those um, issues or that issue uh, found its way into Senate Bill 69. And so while we may consider this priority as uh, resolved, we of course as a board will continue to always focus um, on substance misuse and give it equitable treatment. The behavioral health response before, during, and after a crisis, I've addressed again the gap, and we're still working on the annex of the behavioral health plan to our regional emergency plan. Uh, we'll talk about the um, Nevada Resilience Project, uh, which is something that both the health district and uh, Washoe County HSA work together on and have every reason to be so proud of the results of this. And really the credit goes to our ambassadors. These are a group of uh, care professionals that reach out to those individuals who tested positive for COVID and are willing to speak to an ambassador, which is about 97%. In just six months, we've had nearly 10,000 individuals that have spoken to a, an ambassador is what we, we branded that. And many times it may just be to say, Dorothy, test positive, how are you doing? This is a check-in call. And Dorothy may say, you know, I'm fine, I'm good, thanks. Or Dorothy may say, I'm, I'm all right, but I, I don't know how to get food. I can't leave the house. Um, Dorothy may say, I'm really stressful or my children are having a bad reaction or, um, I need help with utility. So these ambassadors have a very robust um, resource guide and have been able to provide resource and outreach to, as I said, just in six months, um, almost 10,000. A, a contact is considered a conversation that is 10 minutes or more. So I just, I, I can't say enough about the ambassadors um, and thank you to the state because that was a, a grant through FEMA passed down to the state and then down to Washington. So we talk about that. And of course, I, I include the CHIP, the Community Health Improvement Plan um, developed by the health district because we as a board agreed to support the CHIP, the behavioral health piece in particular. Uh, we also know that um, housing, we've had a great um, presentation today on housing or lack thereof. And we know that that lack of housing just exacerbates any mental health issues that may exist. So uh, we continue to support the implementation of the CHIP. Additional areas of discussion for our board, we have not necessarily cited these as 
priorities that we are going to address with workable strategies, but that doesn't mean they cannot be. These are just items that have come up in our past meetings. And so I uh, have included that. Diversity and inclusion, mental and behavioral health needs of children, and then the behavioral health workforce. So you can review the narrative on that. Section nine um, is a little bit more robust than it might be in other years. Um, the session ended, the last session, sort of mid, mid report, the report was already uh, submitted for last year. So while we had, we were in the process of uh, Senate bill moving, 69 moving through this session. So what I've done here in today's report this year is to provide a legislative update, not only on our bill, Senate Bill 69, but the other regional policy board bills, Senate Bill 70, which was the Northern region, Senate Bill 44, which is the rural region, and Senate Bill 56, which was Clark's. As I said, there is a Southern region and we have just had appointed a Southern region behavior health coordinator. Um, Ken Donahue. So we're excited to um, see what that board will um, do in the coming session. Then I've also added the Senate, bi the Senate the bills, the pieces of legislation that the board um, officially supported via letter to the um, respective committees. Um, I, I think we're all on our board aware, and um, again, I'm using the word proud, of the work that not only our chair, Senator Julie Ratti, put into this Assemblywoman Sarah Peters, especially on Assembly Bill 181, the parity bill, it's a beast. And I can't um, say enough about the participation and the influence they had all of these past. I did a quick summary. I probably didn't get all of the highlights, but I wanted to add that in our report because I thought it was significant work that we did, if, if nothing else, done by support. The section 10, this is where uh, normally I would put the behavioral health data and then I would reference the profile. We don't have a profile, but I did include a few things. Um, I talk about the profile, which I highlighted. The Regional Behavioral Health Policy Board data website, you'll remember a couple of meetings ago, I highlighted this, I uh, took us through. Um, Super excited about this, still in a bit of a, a piloting stage. The coordinators are trying to determine the most efficient way to get resources on this website without being duplicative, but still at the same time being accurate. And of course, there's opportunity to put events, meeting dates, and so um, excited about that and a shout out to um, the Northern Regional Behavioral Health Coordinator, Jessica Flood, who um, was just pushy enough to get the state to give us some money to, to get the um, website going. So thank you again, Jessica, I am just on today. <laughs> the next session talks about the Middle Health America 2022 report. So this is one of those, in fact, almost every meeting you go to when people um, bemoan Nevada's rankings. Um, it's often referred back to Mental Health America report. This is not county specific, it's state, but we realize that it's important to, to look at state data as well. I include this every year. This report, even though it's done annually, also goes back a year and sometimes two for some indices. This is worth taking some time to look at. I will not go through all the elements. I will just say that overall, under adults, Nevada's ranking overall, and, and I should say states that are ranked 1 to 13 have a lower prevalence of mental health and higher rates of access to care. And then 39 to 51 indicate that adults have a higher prevalence of mental illness and lower rates. Uh, Nevada's ranking overall is 40th. It improved by two points from last year's report. Again, remembering that using data from a year or more, and I wanna address that in closing. And then I'm gonna scroll down and the same data for youth. Uh, really interesting and 
somewhat depressing. Nevada's overall ranking is 51st, which remains the same um, from last year's. And the youth is uh, the same. States with rankings one to 10 have a lower prevalence of mental health and higher rates of access to care for youth. And states 39 to 51, the rivers. So Nevada has a bit of work to do. Um, we did have some significant improvements. And again, take the time to look through that. The next slides, um, and um, I don't know who it was. I want to say it was Assemblywoman Peters had mentioned something about utilization data, clinic utilization data. This is some data that I've received from the Office of Analytics. Some of the charts I made, and some of them are copy and pasted. You'll be able to take a look at this. But this is some up to date information. So, again, important 2020. So, I wanted you to be able to see that. I'm not going to stop, um, but I've got some age. We've got some race and ethnicity figures uh, through 2020. So I think those are significant to look at. We've got some charts, again, from the Office of Analytics um, dashboards. This is um, some suicide data. There is lots and lots of information on suicide, unfortunately. Um, these were some of the more prominent charts that I provided for 2020. You'll see Washer, we do have some counties. Um, they combine some counties within. I've explained that there at the bottom. Uh, I've got gender and death count by method, again, from the State Office of Analytics. And then we've got some suicide. Uh, these are county specific. I've got Washoe, Clark, and then the balance of other counties. And you'll see um, the numbers there at the end by age. Washoe and Nevada still are seeing an extremely high rate of suicide for our seniors, age 65 and above. The last data reporting showed us as a state three times the national average and as a county four times. I do not have the current updated on that, but our numbers are still showing high. Um, the last was a uh, some substance information, methamphetamine and stimulant surveillance 2020. So we've got some updated numbers here. Uh, I've got Nevada and county. So, We'll see Washoe's numbers are second to Clark. Um, I want to draw your attention when you are reading the charts. I want you to take a look at the race ethnicity charts um, and the disparity there. The uh, methamphetamine deaths, and those are current or more current. And I've got those by Washoe and state. The same for the opioid surveillance. And again, thank you to the state uh, of Nevada Office of Analytics. This is where these numbers are coming from. I did provide a, a summary. So for those that aren't as visual and just want to read some bullet points, I did that. And then I wrap up the report with a summary. What I would want to just end um, by reading two statements, um, if you'll allow me to do that. Um, I've been sitting in the last few weeks really in a lot of meetings where some data reports have been given and they're all a couple of years old and, and a lot of times people in the audience have expressed concern that it's not current data and and that's true in some cases. Um, what I will say is that Statewide, there's some impressive and comprehensive research which makes the decision around inclusion in this report challenging. As with most extensive data reports, the results are not always the most current year and often a year or more behind. This ensures the accuracy and fidelity to the data as it takes time to correlate, but sometimes can present the impression that it's not current. And so what we do is we include the data that we get that is most current. I would say that the um, readers can clearly see trends and patterns, but not necessarily explanations. It's the task of all of us to take the next steps in exploring causation and moving towards solutions. Um, 
I would just stand that um, our board, and again, I'm just going to read my closing statement. The Washer Regional Behavioral Health Policy Board is pleased to present priority strategies and recommendations that are based on what has been learned through careful examination of programmatic research, Nevada and Washa specific data, national best practices, and the experience of many regional experts in the field of behavioral health. While recognizing the challenges we face, we must remember that Nevada remains at the bottom of many national indices for behavioral health issues and how they are addressed. For other health issues, resources are allocated for their eradication and research. It's unacceptable for Washoe County or the state of Nevada to fail to move forward as a leader in our commitment to protect and provide services to those in our community that are suffering from behavioral health issues. And then I respectfully submit it and offer an appendix, appendix which I will um, update. So that is the report. Forgive me for going a little bit over time and allowing me to um, do a little fossil <laughs> value there. But um, I am open to questions or suggestions or thoughts. Um, and if not, I will um, ask you to review that over the next month. Sure. Thank you, Dorothy, for the presentation. Um, do any of the board members have questions or comments? This would be your opportunity if there's something that you'd like to see presented differently or um, any other feedback that you might want to give Dorothy before she brings it back to our next meeting. Not seeing any. Um, I will just note from a process standpoint so we're always trying to figure out um, between Dorothy and myself as the chair, the best and most meaningful use of your time and balancing um, efficient use of your time in a public meeting and also like moving things forward. So right now we're doing something perhaps a little unusual in that um, we had talked well over a year ago about did we want, the, did the board wanna do a strategic plan? Do we wanna set our priorities and then work towards those priorities? Or are you more comfortable with Dorothy and I just kind of bringing pieces to you? And then she writes the report based on kind of what we do over the course of the year. And so our priorities get identified as they emerge through the work that we're doing in the year. So instead of being sort of proactive on the front end and saying, these are priorities and this is what we're going to work towards, we do our work. And then she does an amazing job of summarizing that work. Um, I think you can see that we're making some good progress. I had forgotten about some of the things we had done. <laughs> and so if you think about a year ago, we, we talked a lot about the community health improvement planning process and specifically because the plan had to be extended for a year and many of you leaned into the behavioral health part of that process. So we talk about it here in a board and then some of you will go and participate in this process. Or the Nevada Resiliency Project, I, I just wanna pause on that. I really do think it is likely unprecedented that in a disaster, a particular disaster that has lasted as long as the pandemic, where we have a behavioral health response where we have been able to say that if you get a positive diagnosis through a PCR test that goes through the health district, your name is gonna be passed on to a resiliency ambassador who's gonna call and do a wellness check on you. I, mean, I just, the closest things we've had to that are after a fire, sending some folks to the um, emergency shelter, not the homeless shelter, but the actual you know disaster shelter. But from August of 2020 through to today, um, with the exception of a couple of times when the surges just kind of took out the system because we weren't able to do contact tracing or any of that work, people have been getting a phone call to make sure that they're okay. I think it's unprecedented. Um, and so we had presented some of that work to you and 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 got your blessing to move forward on that. And so that work has been ongoing. Um, so. I just, it's a little bit of a check-in because this, this report is sort of a summary of what we all do collectively, both in the space of our meetings, but also then what you inspire us to go on and work on uh, representing you in other spaces. So um, it's also perfectly fine to give us feedback that it's great for this year, but next year I'd like to be a little bit more proactive on the front end or anything along those lines. So with that, I will just 
to check in with the board. How are you guys doing on how we're doing this process? Does this annual report reflect what we're really doing? Um, and, and do you feel comfortable that this, this is a meaningful, that this is one of our required deliverables under the statute, that this reflects you and your work? So I'll ask for any comments, uh, Dr. Biondi? Yeah, you know, I'll say, I just wanted to mention, I'm, I'm new really to the board. And um, uh, so I, I was not sort of part of the, uh, the projects and things that went on last year. I find it really, really um, informative and eye-opening and certainly um, sort of lends itself to sort of where, where to go next. One thing, Dorothy, that you mentioned was mental health uh, and the increasing sort of incidence of mental health issues in seniors. And I find that very interesting and, and sometimes difficult to really, um, to really pinpoint, right? It's, it's, it's sort of, a, it looks different, um, I think, uh, without going into a, a lot of detail. And so um, that was my thought and suggestion if, if we're sort of going to go somewhere. Um, I, I don't know what's more desperately needed. Obviously, uh, the youth uh, related mental health issues are incredibly, terribly important as well. Um, so. Okay. Thank you for that feedback. Other comments or questions about the report or the direction? Kristen Davis Coelho here. Um, yeah, I like the format. Um, I'll take a closer look at it before the next meeting, but I think it was well organized. I think it was a great summary of the work we've done. Um, and like you, Julie, I had sort of forgotten some of the things we had done. Like, oh, wow, we had a very busy and productive year. Look at that. Um, so, uh, so I like it. It looked fairly comp comprehensive. So good work on that, Dorothy. Uh, Henry. Henry Sotelo here. First of all, I want to say I, I actually went through all of the pages when Dorothy sent it out. Then the report's fantastic. It, it provided a lot of information and provided depth and context. Now, regarding, regarding us as a committee, I've been on the committee, I believe it's been two years, maybe a little bit more. And I think we've made a lot of, gotten a lot of traction with what we're doing and what we've accomplished. And we're getting a lot of, of the community coming to us no, now. I remember before it was a little more difficult to get, to get groups, you know, providers or people coming in and presenting to us to get information and ideas. I like the track and trajectory that we're on right now. I think we're gonna, it's gonna keep snowballing as far as uh, groups, folks, different you know, areas coming, folks with different areas coming to us to provide ideas. I like the idea of maybe trying to focus on certain areas of, of the community that we need to work on more and then reaching out to those areas or, have, or having them come to provide information to us so we can act on it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Henry. Others? Questions or comments? Okay. So to make sure that we stay in good stead with open meeting law. I just wanna make sure that nobody does a reply all. If you have any feedback on the plan that you'd like to give Dorothy, you are welcome to give that to her. It is not direction, it is feedback. And then she will bring back a draft for us to look at in the open meeting setting at our next meeting. And that would incorporate suggestions or changes based on her best judgment and the process for deciding what the final report looks like will happen at the next meeting. So just, you all have it, make sure you don't reply all. And um, if you have questions or feedback for Dorothy, please go ahead. And then that will be shared at the next board meeting for the approval of the plan. Dorothy. And um, thank you, Chair, for um, soliciting some response and feedback. And I would just, again, just stress what I did in my email. Um, I absolutely would never want to put words in any of your mouths. And there are some, some narratives where um, I got a little passion. Um, I tried to relay what I think that we have all expressed, but uh, please remember this is your report and I want to express your intent, not Dorothy's. So read with an eye to that. Um, and I am fine with, with that criticism and changes. So thanks, Chair. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and close item number seven and move on to item number eight, which is a discussion of an approval of future agenda items. So uh, we are now getting close to needing to move into the phase where our presentations start to have uh, policy recommendations. 
And you'll, I think we had a pretty successful process last uh, legislative cycle of either board members bringing forward a policy idea that they would like to see the behavioral health board adopt or through your networks, asking um, folks to come forward, you know, people are suggesting something to you and you, you say, hey, go, go ask for a, um, ask for a presentation to the behavioral health board. So just as a reminder for future agenda items, we are looking for anybody in the audience, anybody of your colleagues, any of you, if you have a policy recommendation that you would like us to consider for our BDR, to bring that forward and ask Dorothy for a um, opportunity to present that to the board. And then you'll recall as a board, we Dorothy cataloged all those, she did a summary of them close to our deadline to submit, and then we chose a bill draft. Um, our bill draft is due September 1st. So it's time <laughs> to start thinking about that. So please do um, urge, urge folks to bring those ideas forward if you have them. Um, we also are going to reach out to uh, the state and see if they have as we've been going through this crisis response system implementation planning process, if they are already seeing any um, adjustments that might need to be made to NRS that would support the ongoing implementation of the crisis response um, project as well, so that we have that, that input. And of course we have um, the wonderful Assemblywoman Peters, who, um, as you may recall last time, we had some ideas that didn't get selected um, but we figured out different ways that some of those ideas could move forward, even if they weren't the board's um, particular, particular. So she has already communicated that she's interested in all of the ideas, regardless of whether or not it's the behavioral health board, because it's a wonderful opportunity to hear about what the community is looking for for policy ideas. So spread the word for that, for future agenda items. Any other future agenda items that anyone would like to request? All right, I don't hear any. So I'm gonna go ahead and close item number eight and move on to item number nine, which is public comment. It can be on any matter that is not on the items we've already discussed on the agenda, but anything else. So is there anybody in the public who would like to make comment? Let me just give it a minute for folks to get unmuted. Not hearing or seeing any public comment, moving on to agenda item number 10, which is a reminder of our next meeting date. We're in that fun part of the year where the March meeting date matches the February meeting date. So it will again be on the 14th. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing you a month from now on the 14th. I believe we are anticipating a presentation from the Children's Be uh, Mental Health Consortium. Is that correct, Dorothy? It is, yes. So. Um, there was some comment about, do we focus on, do we look at focusing on um, a specific population, whether that be seniors or youth? Just a reminder that there's a whole separate group that is the Children Health, Children's Mental Health Consortium. So they're gonna come and talk to us about what they're doing. They, however, do not get a bill draft. So that is also um, something that I would ask that you keep in mind. Um, all right, that's it. I think we'll move on to item, agenda, item number 11 which is adjourned. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Anyone? <laughs> I motion to adjourn. All right, got a motion from Assemblywoman Peters. Sandy, I'll, take oh. I'll, yeah. I'll take Char. I don't think Char she's Burley. got any of them yet. Okay, so I've got a motion from Assemblywoman Peters, second from Char Burley. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, then you're on your own. You can hang on the meeting. <laughs> uh, well, we'll see you all in a month. Thank you. Bye. Thanks thank you. Bye. Great meeting. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Enjoy your evening. Great.
Did Steve forget us again? You're on mute if you're talking, Dorothy. Okay. So funny, Gus will not go outside. Like he's just sitting in my oh, office going, that's... nope, I'm not going with daddy unless you're going too, mama. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's, I saw his tail. Yeah, I'm like, okay, we have to go. Uh, should we try to get Steve back or? Yeah, I texted him, can you jump on again? Okay, I'm just going to run to the restroom real quick. Yeah, for sure. Nice work. Report looks great. I mean, it's super oh, good. comprehensive. Um, good. Yeah, I've got some formatting, but um, I I just I sure wish we had data. <laughs> I feel like I'm always apologizing for old data. I mean, all of us feel that way, you know. And and then the state said, surprise, we're not going to do an FE report again, which really it makes sense. It really does. It caused some you know, a little bit of grief among some of the coordinators. I mean, but it, it's duplicative in so many areas, you know, and um, YBRS and BRFSS, you know, those are every two years. And um, I wished it wasn't, but so. So, I mean, interestingly, we are going through our community health needs assessment process right now, right? I'm so sorry. Interestingly, we're starting our community health needs assessment process. So there will be a limited set of behavioral health data that gets included in that process, but it's going to be the same issue, right? Like we're going to be asking for the BRS test and we're going to be like, so it's limited and we are very specifically going from a 400 page report to a not 400 page report and a whole lot fewer indicators than yeah. we had in the past. But I did um, check in on the internship. And so my question for you is, we have an internship for 150 hours. And what I don't know from the last time you did this, when Katrina was in this position, were you able to fill that full 150 hours? And do we think it will again? Because that time they were building it from scratch and had to do, you know, like had to kind of start from scratch. So that's my question. The other question is, I think Heather did a lot of, a lot of the supervising or helping to make sure that the data got collected correctly and steered and Heather doesn't have that kind of capacity. So are we really just looking at, it's already got oh, a Heather framework. Heather Kerwin, okay. Yeah, Heather one of Kerwin. Our, one of our interns was Heather and I was, okay. Yeah, so we're not gonna have a lot of Heather Kerwin time. So um, if any, so just wanna, those are my two questions for you. 150 hours, does that still make sense or should we be anticipating they're gonna need to do another health district project as well? And can you, now that you've had to do it by yourself without an intern, can you be more directly involved with helping the intern get the data? Uh, first question, um, yes, you would need a, another project. I think both of the interns had one. Uh, I would need to check with Sheila whether Lauren did, um, who was a dynamite, and Heather was very good too, but not quite as. Um, I would say maybe half the time. Okay. I was thinking how long it took me. I did it during quarantine and I would say 
80 hours I probably put in, you know, I mean, that's rough. Um, and I would want the same quality that I did. So, and I'd be there to help for sure. Assuming, you know, again, if, if I take on, which is kind of a off topic, but not really, if I do the crisis, if I'm the point, point mm -hmm. person for the crisis response, uh, which I, you know, kind of excited about the thought, really, but oh, good. Um, that, but yeah, yeah, no, but, but, you know, I, I don't know what my um, workload, you know, my bandwidth would be in terms right. of how much help an intern. Um, I, I suffer from, we're going through a supervisory training and my big um, need for improvement among many is uh, I don't delegate well. I prefer to do things myself because. Yeah, I just I'm in the same training. So <laughs> Different pod, but same training. <laughs> Um, so anyway, um, so that's that question. And then the second question was, what would I be available? Yeah, um, I would. Yeah, because I, I think want... that the internship would probably get started here pretty soon. I and thought we'll it in... was May when Katrina, she interviewed. I Actually, she and I interviewed. Um, and we waited too long for this Heather, which sounds horrible, but... So the pickings, they'd already picked projects. I should put it that way. Right. So, um, you know, I don't know, Julie. I mean, I'm fine if, if the juice isn't worth the squeeze. I mean, but if you're going to get one and they can be of significant help to you and you find that we can split and I can have her or him for some hours, you know, absolutely. Because okay. there's a lot of... Like, I hate reference checks. So, I mean, hours spent making sure that you do the right citations and all that. And so, you know, I do it, but I, anyway, so those are your answers. Um, I'll okay. support whatever you decide. Okay. Well, um, I'm getting the link now to get in touch with the school to be able to post hours. And that oh, was the major on. question me... is. I'm sorry. Let me let Steve in. Okay. <laughs> keep going um so i just needed i need to write like a little description up of what the internship would be um mm -hmm. and i needed to know if it was just the behavioral health piece or if we're going to do um something more so sounds like we would need another project so that's fine. um okay other I told than him that, to try again. He said he tried. He stepped away. Okay, here he is. Let me admit it. We probably didn't didn't see him and didn't let him in. He's, here he is. <laughs> Figures every time you step away, right? <laughs> there we go. Sorry about that. I stepped away to the bathroom. Oh, awesome. Same. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we were just briefly talking about it. Does look like we're going to be able to get an intern again to be able to do the behavioral health profile. And so oh, we're just good. talking about, we get 150 hours. So Dorothy was saying about 80 of those would make sense for the behavioral health profile. And then I'll find another project within the health district for the intern, um, probably something on our health equity project that we're standing up. Um, so that's good. And then, I mean, we talked about the report and I think it looks good. I don't think it needs major changes. I think Dorothy's working some miracles because- Oh, I think it looks great, Julia. Fantastic <laughs> job, Dorothy. Thanks. Yeah. It was very <laughs> comprehensive. It reminded me of everything that's been done. Yeah, yeah. And I, like, we don't do anything up front to say, hey, these are our priorities. We just do what we're doing. And then she does a miraculous job of saying, mm -hmm. these were our priorities. Here's what we <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's why I asked, you know, because I did take a little editorial license. But it looked like everybody on the board was happy to take credit for all that. So, <laughs> I, I, Julie, I was thinking of our conversation we had Friday night and um, chuckling as, as I was listening. I didn't want to look you in the eye, dare I, you know, start laughing. Just, 
kind of a private joke, Steve, but we were just, yeah. actually, my husband stepped in and said, were you arguing with a synagogue? And I said, no, we're just, just we but have I robust being, conversations. I was being very passionate and Julia was like, Absolutely not. <laughs> Julia was exhausted and saying, hell no, I don't want subcommittees. Are you kidding? <laughs> so I, I liked your positive email response, Steve, but mine was like, no. <laughs> and my response was politically correct. I'm going to put it on pause. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we did want to check in with you on that because your response was, I wouldn't say polar opposite, but very different end of the spectrum of my response, Steve. So let's just check on check in on that for a little bit so my and i will just acknowledge 100 that coming out of the senate i am dated i am specifically quitting that work so this is the last thing that i have in my life where i have to do open meeting law right and so every one of those subcommittees would have to be open meeting law and so then that's my question is does having another open meeting do we get any more productivity out of our board in terms of doing anything? <laughs> yeah, actually doing some of the workload or is it just another meeting where people get to attend, they get to share their opinion and then they leave and Dorothy primarily does all the work, which is fine. Uh, my stronger reaction was to the legislative one because I don't see a way where I'm not on the legislative one. I mean, I could, I could just walk away and say, no, that's not my thing anymore. Um, but I don't actually see that happening. And the legislative stuff, we just have to make very quick decisions, which we can kind of do like this, but we can't do that if there's an actual official subcommittee created. And I think what I'd envision the legislative committee was more um, kind of what I do for HSA. Um, so really I can do it for the board as well, but it was more, you know, tracking behavior health bills and then noting what the impact would be the behavioral health again you just informing educating i don't know if there's anybody that's interested or appropriate. and i have to do that as part of my role at hsa so right. i admit it seems you know i suppose repetitive to have someone else do it would be nice. well, and I think I compare it to the Nevada Public Health Association that has a legislative committee, right? And so that's a, a room where public health professionals can kind of get in a room and talk about, do we support this? I don't know if we support this. What is this? And you can't say any of what that conversation is on the record, right? It, yeah. It's the safe, frank space of, oh, shit, we're going to have to go and publicly testify in favor of this, because if we don't, we're going to offend these people over here, but it's not the thing that we like so much, so can we get it amended? Like, it's those kinds of conversations that don't lend themselves to an open meeting um, and like were the bane of my existence when I was on the Spark City Council and the Spark City Council wanted to talk about what the legislature was doing. And so inevitably they would actually screw up legislative strategy by pitching about things in a public meeting that would then get back to legislators who would piss them off. And then, you know, you're doing all this work to like, no, 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 Councilman Kerrigan didn't really mean that you're an idiot. What he really meant was, you know, so, I have a bias that any meaningful legislative conversations happen kind of behind closed doors. And to Julia's point in our discussion, Steve, I mean, I'm a, a bit of a Pollyanna, I suppose, but I was thinking that, you know, by creating a couple of committees, we might get more participation from our board, more buy and more passion. Frankly, we're lucky that we get what we get. Um, and I felt pressured by looking at some of the other board priorities and strategic plans. So Julia, thank you so much, so much for verbalizing that and just asking the board. I feel 100% better. It's, it's, that's like off my concern list. Everyone likes the way we're doing it. It's cool. Now, if Julia drops off our board, Steve. And she can't. <laughs> I, well, I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of people maybe that would want to be a chair, but you are the vice chair right now. <laughs> Julia forever. 
A lot, yeah. Tell them, Dorothy, that's not going to happen. I probably have a year left in me. I was um, saying before we should start thinking governor. about transition. You like that, ratty for governor? I like that sound. Yes. Never running for office again. Thank you. Uh, well, you would have to compete against <laughs> Joey Gilbert. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I could be so inappropriate. I won't. But yeah. But so since you had a more enthusiastic response, so that was my response to the legislative one, but the diversity and inclusion is interesting, right? Um, but I think that, you know, what that might look like then is somebody like you, Steve, saying, all right, well, I'm willing to take a, a subcommittee and do some work that we then bring back to the board. Right. Um, and then you and Dorothy could work on that. So then Dorothy and I could work on keeping the whole thing going and probably getting that bill dialed in and if we wanted to engage the board, the question is, will the board engage? And that was my bottom line question to Dorothy. It's like, when you look around the room and you look at who's busy or who likes to tell us what the problems are, but not necessarily the solution or who rolls their, you know, sleeves up and works. And they're all already participating on the crisis response. The ones who actually do stuff are True. participating in the crisis response, which is on my calendar, five meetings this week. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, so do we really think anybody will do any more because it's a catch 22, right? We don't engage them so that they're not engaged. If we did more to engage them, they would probably be more engaged, but who's going to, so I, I mean, it would really, I think, look like you have a passion for this and want to do that. And I'm good with that. Just remember it's an open meeting zone. Yeah, when you put it all that way, Julie, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, at first when J Dorothy mentioned the subcommittees, I thought, great, you know, that would probably allow us to really delve into some, some, you know, issues in a more, I don't know, robust, not robust way, but maybe a more comprehensive way yeah, that deeper. we can't really get into during the, the, the monthly meetings. But I agree, you're right. I think everybody is so stretched. Yeah. All of us are in so many different meetings that I worry about what kind of participation would we get. Yeah. So and I see I'm it not, both ways. And I'm not willing to let it go 100%, but I say probably we just table it for now and maybe revisit it next year or something. See what we can do to motivate, you know. Um, they get really excited. And of course, Julia, you stepped out during session, but the board gets super excited when they see our, our bill moving. And I, every week, I mean, we, I think I copied you, but I'm, you know, I am always telling, oh, we did this today, we did that, it moved, it did, and they, that's the most engaged I see them, don't you think, Steve? I mean, yes. they're like, because they, you know, they take ownership for it, yeah, right. right or wrong, <laughs> right Which or wrong. Great. No, that's great. So maybe if we succeed in our crisis um, response system plan, um, that might make them feel also even more apart because our board has focused, and that was the other thing, you know, when we talked about bills. I mean, we've built on crisis response since Sheila. I mean, the state introduced when Sheila was, they brought forward crisis now, and we that's that's been the focus. So let's build on what our success has been and see, you know, Take it out, see how it works. Well, and if you think about, so it's February now. So this time a year from now, it's the first or second week of the session. Yep. Right. So we're going to be busy from now until September, figuring out what our bill draft is. We're going to be busy from September until January, making sure that the details of our bill are in good shape so that it can get out of drafting. And we met with Sarah and she basically said, it would be lovely if you all could run with that. And I don't have to worry about this one. But she has to worry about, she's have, she has 15 bill drafts as the chair of the interim health committee. I love Five of which so have to be child focused, plus her own 10, plus she'll be probably chairing health, which is another five. So she had lots of vehicles to do whatever she wants to do. And so therefore is perfectly happy for us to, it needs to be something that she's on board with. Other than that, she wants it to be whatever the board wants it to be, and she's happy to be the champion for it. So um, they both pushed me 
uh, Sarah and Dorothy both pushed me a little bit in that conversation did not just take a simple thing like a, I just wanted to go to Dr. Water and say, I know we're gonna need some tweaks to the crisis response system. It makes sense for us to be us. let's just do that. Cause it's easy, right? I know that we can do that. Um, but let's see what the community wants and see what, what folks come forward with. And sounds like we, as long as it's not something that Sarah's personally disagreeing with or is such a big lift, like we're trying to take on hospitals or insurance companies too much. Yeah. Those are always fun in the legislative session. Um, we'll see. What and I, shows up. I mean, I thought a lot about it. I want, I, I, you know, I did. I pushed again because of my nature. I'm like, wait, you know, let's see what the will of the people is and all of that. And then I want that. But we also want something that will pass, which sounds, I mean, but that will make a change, you know, that we'll make a difference. Even yeah. if it's a little small thing. Plus, Steve, we work so hard on crisis. It makes sense to have the state in their knowledge, or at least listen to, and I think it's only fair to have Dr. Woodard say, gosh, this stands in the way. You know, we don't know what we don't know. Well, Julia may know, but I, you know, and so I respect that as well. I don't think we're not asking the people's will because, you know, our county needs crisis stabilization. Yeah. We, if there's the people's will, there's, you know, there's where we need it, that and the homeless debacle. So. Well, I was going to say the other thing we really should keep a close eye on is all of the housing that they're planning to build over in the NAMS campus. I don't know what all those details are yet, but I just hear that it's a major, major project. Yeah. I don't know anything about it. Dorothy, do you know anything about it? I'm not yeah, I don't sure. think it's public knowledge yet, but I well, do I'm know not... that there's a big plan coming from the governor for supported housing. Yes. Yeah, no, yeah. I don't. I, I, I don't. I mean, I'm not. I was running through the meeting. I'm like, thinking, on the do small. I know about that? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I do that I don't a lot. Think so. That sounds vaguely familiar. Let me think. Let me <laughs> plumb the depths of my. I, think I know Jeff not... Haig is working on it. Yes, I've heard yeah. that as well um, about to that level of detail, right? And um, and that would be great, except for right. if it pushes off <laughs> other things that we're trying to accomplish, but we'll see. Um, well, Julie, I'm still anxious to see how the state pulls all this off with all of the proposals we've submitted. I haven't heard that anybody, anyone's been awarded yet. I know I they're reviewing. So. so we just delayed, we just decided to cancel our leadership team meeting with the highest levels. So the hospital CEO slash county manager slash city manager level, because it's scheduled for February 28th and we weren't confident that 14 days from now we would be able to say, either say here's a, a pretty good almost done plan or here we can give you updates on who the providers are or here's Medicaid rate, wise. like any progress. So we're gonna have the TAC meeting because we do think we'll be able to sh share a pretty good chunk of what the plan looks like and get some feedback from them. Um, so I'm responding to a couple of questions that Dr. Woodard has regarding our proposal at Renown, but I don't see this being wrapped up by the end of February. I'm hoping because, you know, I've reminded them every day and week that we get further behind on making this decision, the further we're going to be behind on trying to launch right. the crisis center. So I'm just trying to, you know, keep the momentum going. Steve, um, a question that came up in our, um, we had a de department meeting. And, and so it was basically Amber's version of coffee with the manager only it was her and, and it was good. It was, you know, a lot of frank questions, but um, I, I just, I want to know your, your impression or your opinion, um, you know, Julia's. Do you think that we need a CTC and a CSC? I think I know your answer, but. Because, you know, I'm prepared. Uh, Manager Brown has reached out to me and we've been <laughs> playing phone tag for the last couple of days. And I know that's exactly what he's going to ask me. Okay, yes, sorry. Do, do you want to practice? Need... <laughs> I don't want to lose what the CTC has been providing. Now, whether it has to be done in that setting, I don't know. You know, I would love to find out from WellCare, can they blend that in with 
you know, somewhere else, they, you know, they're running crossroads. Could they do something at crossroads that meets that need? I don't know, but I don't think we need to abandon what WellCare has been doing by any means. Yeah. I just don't know where that needs to be. Yeah, I would just, I yeah. thought that's. And I don't know enough about what else WellCare is doing in the community, Dorothy, on where they could probably absorb that. I don't know if at all. Yeah. Yeah, because we know they're going to have to be look. They're going to have to look for another location sooner than later, unless yeah. the city just allows them to stay there indefinitely. So I think we're going to be, you know, faced with that decision at some point. Yeah. But I don't I, think the hospitals just want to drop the CTC automatically. No. But are you going to fund it? <laughs> that I don't know yet. We haven't even had those discussions. <laughs> but my recommendation would be that we don't abandon it. We figure out how we have, you know, we keep it going because we still don't know how the crisis center is going to play out. We, we no. need to get enough data from the stabilization center before well, we just say we're not going to be funding these other programs. And that's to our point earlier in our meeting was why, you know, we will defer the leadership meeting. Because I think once we get an answer, they'll they'll know too who's been awarded. But that's a good carrot because anytime you start talking about money, and and Amber, I'm she she'd give me permission to say this because I've asked her before. I'm like, why are you at this meeting? She's oh, if it's got money in the title, I'm there. And so you know, if we entice them and say, okay, we're going to talk about you know, then we we'll got the money. Interested. Well, and I just want to be very clear on my part. I keep saying we need both. I don't know if we need both forever, but I think we absolutely need both for the first year of operation. Right. And I will say we need both in any public setting because I don't want Max to fail. So I still think that there's a world where even if you don't need the CTC as it is currently, there's still services that we need. And right. so rather than, I think my experience with government programs is if you just close a door, you never get that door open again. Right. But if you transition it to something else, sometimes you can keep that funding going to something that we need maybe more than that. But if we just shut it, it just goes away. That reason. Sure. That's why Julia was so adamant about us making sure we get operating funds for the first year. Yeah. So that we've got some a cushion there and we're not so yeah. pressed to have to make these tough decisions, you know, quickly. We can let right. let it take time and see how it evolves. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can't turn or you aren't going to turn anyone away should you do these right we're not we won't be allowed to turn anyone away no and my fear is that you'll fill up like that with folks that really could benefit just with the triage and maybe not i mean to someone's point kelly's are, you know they have to be in crisis but a triage center can often stabilize that person right. and the crisis associated crisis so they don't need to go to the well crisis. i think what we, what we can't have is a dependence on remsa paramedics and law enforcement officers to be able to do the triage that helps them to understand okay this is what's happening with this person so i'm going to take them to a ctc and this is what's happening with this yeah, person i'm going to take yeah. them to a csu yeah. That that's unrealistic. So whatever the the door is, it's yeah. more if you come to the door and then we get you sorted out to the right service versus maybe we make a CTC right next to a crisis. We just explain. Well, and and then when we say CTC, if you look at their reports, some of them are like two, three, four days. That's not the model. It's actually right. not the CTC model or the CSU. <laughs> I was right. going to say it's not either model. Just to be clear, um, and so you know maybe, but Dorothy, you've used it. I've used it where we need a bed for somebody, and yes. welfare at the CTC will say, "All right, I'll take. We'll, we'll yeah. take them because there's no place else to put them." She and has, so Amy has bailed us out. So losing those beds where somebody can stay for multiple nights, where you're solving a more complex problem, yeah, is not something that we want to lose, and so. Even if it's that, okay, if it's sub 24, it's at the CSU. And the moment it goes above 24, the CTC is one of the many places 
that they can be stepped up to, that would be, in my mind, a win. Exactly. No, a CTC would be the step down. Well, right now they're doing two, three, four day placement. Well, I mean, not people still. are staying there for much longer. They don't have the rule that says we're going to stop paying you at 23 hours and 59 minutes. How many beds does Mallory have, Steve? You know, I want to say they average about 15 a day. I'm not sure in terms of the number of beds, but I think they they average about 15 patients a day. Well, that was a good board meeting, though, I thought, you know, yeah. I thought the I thought Katrina's was excellent and uh, lots of good questions from the board. I was proud of our board. Yeah, I thought Katrina's presentation was great. I got a lot of yeah. information from her report. It was yeah, and sad. if you're not going to those tab meetings or things like that, you just don't know. Right, exactly. And I thought I knew all this time, but no. Yeah, I'll tell you what, though, because we know that the, the staffing is, is huge and we're fighting, not literally fighting, but so like the sheriff's trying to do, fill up their most people and they're like, <laughs> I don't even know why I'm sharing this. And they're like, okay, well, um, Dana says, well, let's just interview together. <laughs> I'm saying, and the sheriff's like, well, no, because we want to pick who we want. They're very different skill sets. But we're talking like 30 case managers and some clinicians because they want clinicians to. We, we got, I mean, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot, yeah. And trying, yeah. For I mean, one I'm, organization to need that many, that's a lot. Well, we're all struggling in the community right now. I yeah. Know. We have to train our own. You know, we have home. to train our own, yes. But then the county merit based hiring system doesn't allow you to train somebody who doesn't meet the minimum qualifications for the job. So then that's fun. Well, we are exploring, and I, I guess it's not. I mean, she told everybody. So, you know, we're, we're looking at. Well, I was going to tell you about going back to Max. Um, yeah. I don't know if Max is sharing the same information with you both, but he's going down the same path he did this time last year, telling us that he's just going to go ahead and shut down the CTC. Yeah. Um, he hasn't you know, told I, me that directly. I've just heard it now from multiple other people, which is why I have to go to the board and do a presentation on behavioral health on Thursday because Max talked to a council member. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's frustrating. It's confusing to me. So Char is well cared. Amy, I'm looking around. I think I'm the only one on the whole floor now, but Amy is apparently working for us in a contract. And I heard she was still a consultant for Max. Have you heard that too? She, yes. And she's doing something for us. But we're all, what the hell? <laughs> it's a cluster. So when I saw her name pop up, I'm like, she's you know and i'm not sure what char does i left that blank on the annual report i need her to tell me what her title is i don't remember but well i do think the sooner we can get this settled about the the csu the better because there's yeah. just so many things that will come from yeah. that i mean just like the ctc i know max needs answers but i don't think anybody's willing to go on record with that just yet until we know more about the csu yeah well and and you know I mean, we'd all be deaf, dumb, and blind if we didn't, you know, I mean, renown is the heir apparent, you know, I mean, everyone. Well, now the state wants to know what the county and city can contribute, which is great, but we don't really have a lot of time here. Well, and them to go through all of that at the city and county level. And plus, you don't know that you're the only game in town. I mean, you know, in 16 right. beds and enough anyways, you could use. Exactly. And right, the whole then the end, the state may go a different direction. You never know. Maybe. But yeah, hopefully there was nobody. Dawn was on the call and she dropped off. And I was so hoping someone from the state, because I think we were very appropriate. We weren't dog in the state at all. We were just kind of emphasizing. I said it, Julia said it. Kelly, I'd ask her, you know, did she have anything to add? And even Kelly said, you know, we really need the state and there wasn't anybody on, on the call who couldn't say anything even if they were on so well no but they could take it back and say oh yeah so. 
I think Julia, the state's not like the fact that I've I've brought some things about that space to light. You know, no matter who moves into that space at Deeney Townsend, there has to be improvements made. Yeah. We're gonna have a major unsafe situation on our hands. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. You should be making sure that what you are committing to can actually be done and done well. If they were hoping that I could, you know, maybe whittle down our list and not have to, you know, make as many modifications, but I can't find anything. Everything we've recommended really needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Well. I will. Um, if we want to have a Medicaid rate for mobile crisis teams, I think we're going to have to have a bill that says the state must establish a rate for mobile crisis teams, and that could be our BDR. Oh, that's the same thing. Like super hard. It's the same thing that we did with the crisis stabilization units. We we tweaked the licensing, but we also demanded, you know, required that the state say that they set a rate. Um, Big fiscal note. It does. It did come with a fiscal note because they're, I mean, I have to go back and look at that bill, but I'm pretty sure it came with a fiscal note. So that was the frank conversation we had with Sarah. It was like, well, you, you know, I'm worried. I mean, Sarah's great. She's going to have a ton of things, but she's going to have her own priorities. And, you know, when you're sitting down there with 25 bills, there are days where you're like, well, I'm abandoning that one to do this one. Um, and so trying to figure out where those bills live so that they're less likely to be dropped and I mean three of the four behavioral health board bills would have been dead but for I'm not bragging but just for me being down there and nope. saying oh, yeah, that, that, I, oh I totally agree Julia, uh, hundreds of difference. people worked on that well that back come on every yeah I mean that's not but, bragging that's just but no senator that. or assembly person owns those but, well they should Pete Cocatia is on the one and Dr. Titus is on the other, but they're on the Republican side, they don't have any influence. So when you're in the closed door meeting, we're like, well, we're just gonna let these die because we don't have time. Like, ping, 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 we need those. <laughs> you know, well, and then that's when the relationship panic, panic. comes in. <laughs> so I just don't know if Sarah, I don't know if Sarah is going to be, the, I don't know how the assembly works. There's so many more of them. I could say things in the Senate because there's few of us and I was in the number two position and on finance to, to, to see all the places where it might die. I don't know if she will be that, not her skill set, just her, where she is well, in the Well, and is there someone else that could carry that bill and if we picked a different one? Um, I'm sure, so, but Dr. Woodard is good about developing partnerships with legislators to get these kinds of things. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, she's known for a while that I'm not going any, you know, that I'm not gonna be there. So I'm assuming she's cultivating other legislators would be my assumption. We haven't talked about it. Well, I'll do up March's agenda here pretty soon. Um, I'll double check with uh, Jacqueline, sorry, Klein Gelder. Um, make and sure would you tell there. her, would you just check in with her and say, please bring policy recommendations if you have I policy will recommendations so that we get the children's? Because that's the other thing I think is like children's is such a mess. If we could do a bill in conjunction with them. Because last time we're like, well, substance use has been neglected. Well, child, children and adolescents have been neglected too. Uh -huh. So maybe we do a children and adolescents bill this time. Which, yeah. Um, and I'd spoken, Steve, um, you know, about the fact that we've talked a lot about diversity and inclusion, but um, we also discussed the fact that there were other bills out there and supporters. I mean, not that it's not important, but maybe not as impactful or as some of the Senator Spearman and what's yeah. Dallas? Senator Spearman, Harris. Senator Harris, and Senator Donate, like just on the Senate side, people of color who are doing healthcare diversity related bills. I'm so, not sure that the Washoe Behavioral Health Board bill is going to take that lane. Right. Is just so. being very practical about. So I think we, you know, we support. But not every problem is solved through the legislature. So there's definitely diversity and inclusion work that we could be doing at the Washoe level that doesn't require a bill, right? So I don't want that to. I want people to look, though. I mean, so we as a board, you know, we, we look at the diversion and the inclusion in Washoe County. We look at the stats as we get them. and we, But yeah, policy-wise, I don't know. But I was shocked and I wanted to call analytics to make sure it wasn't a mistake. The 
the data for um, methamphetamine deaths and um, opioids for in Washoe County for um, black non-Hispanic was like off the chart. I thought this has to be wrong. We don't have that many black Hispanics in Washington. It's right. The, the proportion of those deaths in Washoe County compared to white or Asian or Hispanic. Because proportionately one would think maybe a min the minority would be a Hispanic, but it, it's a little shocking. I thought, oh, this is wrong. They, they've done something wrong here. So, all right. Um, well, I'm still in the office. I'm going to head home. Well, I'll keep you both posted as I hear more. Hopefully, I hear more this week. I hope you do, Steve. Because I'm submitting some more information to the state tomorrow, and I'm going to press hard that we've got to keep this moving. Have quickly. they asked you um, yet about your budget? Yes. We've gone through the, yes, we've gone through the budget. Hmm. The last I heard is that Dr. Woodard and Don and others are now working with the city and county. Obviously, we wouldn't be part of those discussions, but they no. are trying to find out from the city and county what they're willing to contribute. Uh, yeah. So we'll see where that goes next. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, my assumption would be that Dr. Woodard is getting that pressure from the governor's office or somewhere in that chain to say, all right, we really do want to do this, but we need to see some skin in the game. I think so too, Julia, yeah. Now, Steve, does it, I'm question probably, but I'm just curious more. Are you, does your um, CEO, Tony, right? Tony, yes. Does he involve himself in, in these discussions or is it just Steve Shell? I mean- No, you know, he's very well aware. He's very aware. I'm just just ask Eric is, who's the CEO of regional. So oh. they're very well aware. Yeah. I mean, I, I just wondered how much, you know. No, in fact, Tony's pleased that we're making progress in this. I think Renown's concern all along, even before I came to Renown, is they just don't, they want to make sure they don't completely own the issue for the community. So I think the more I can show partnerships and collaboration. That's why I suggested better. you don't put Renown on the name. If you get the bid, right. you don't put Renown on the name. I agree, yes. That's why in my proposal, I talked a lot about the community partnerships. It wasn't really about Renown. You know, basically I see it as we're using Renown's license right. at regional. Well, and I think the way that everybody needs to be looking at it is, look, there's a significant player who's willing to step up and bet on to come here because nobody knows you do all that work, you can sell it, Steve, because you're selling it. There's this funding source and there's this funding source and it should pencil, but until we actually do it, nobody knows. Right, because so, the Medicaid rate's still right. in the, up in the air. It's not been approved yet. Well, and even if you get the Medicaid rate, you don't know yes or no if the private payers come along. You don't know if they right. panel the CSU. Like exactly. there's all these, all of these things and so like look guys we have somebody who can actually pull it off who's willing to do it so we should probably go before somebody above steve like a tony says you know what risk is too high we're out right that's why i'm so i want the momentum to keep going i mean we've got yeah. to get this completed because i'm worried that somebody may come along and say wait a minute let's let's think about doing it differently and we don't have you know time what? to do that and then what I naively hope is that whoever is picked is successful and then that opens the door. Other people are like, oh, okay, it, that works. We can do that. And then we have a second and a third. Exactly. And we are the model like Washington always is. Because, you know, we may find that there are other locations that already exist in the county that we're not really aware of. There may be other other space that is available that we could modify, that other partners could modify. Right. Yeah. Just so many competing needs. All exactly. Right. Yeah. Well, happy okay. Valentine's gonna, Day. Yes, happy Valentine's, ladies. Have a great night. 
Well, you're all gonna... the romance happening here. Yeah, not so much, but you know. <laughs> all right. Thanks, all guys. Right. Love you. Bye. Bye. Thank Thank you. Bye. Good Bye. luck with Eric. Thank you. I'll keep you posted. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.